Your story is waiting for you today. Your story has something new to say. But your story will only come out to play when you're alone. Alone. Alone in a room with invisible people. The following episode may contain swearing. Alone in a Room with Invisible People is brought to you by hollyswritingclasses.com. If you find value in what we do and you'd like to support the podcast, go to coffee.com, that's K-O hyphen F-I dot com forward slash alone, or you can go to alonewithinvisiblepeople.com forward slash support us to find out more. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rebecca Gallardo, the host of Alone in a Room with Invisible People. I am here today with author and teacher Holly Lyle, and we are answering your questions today. So uh, we're just going to get right into it because these are kind of like mini episodes. I think uh, we're we're filming this all on one day, so or we're recording this all on one day. So so yeah, we're just going to get right into it. Um, this is another older question from the forums. What do you do when you think of a scene change, but while writing, you come up with something else? How do you know which one is better? I've encountered this problem in the last three scenes I've written. My muse likes shiny, dramatic things at the moment and seems to be ramping up the conflict really early. So far, I've gone with the better ideas because they've been more interesting and my muse needed to write the scene to figure out what needed to change. But with the last scene, I'm not sure if it's better or if my muse was just tired and getting bitchy at me. (laughs) So tossed out. Rubbish. Rubbish. The later scene change, the revelation of a deep personal secret, could have problems down the line if I decide later it was a bad idea to keep it or have the MC hide in secret. Or have the MC hide the secret. I'm not afraid of changing it in revision. Editor grumbles at me, but okay. But it's made me doubt which idea was better. The initial ones my muse came up with or the ones she threw out while I was writing. Yeah. It's, it sounds like what she... Oh, okay. Yeah. What the muse threw out at her while yeah. she was writing. Right. Okay. Right. This is, this is one of those evil things your brain does to you where you can't do both. You can only do one. And no matter which one you do, some part of your brain is going to tell you the other one would have been better. Yeah. This is just this is just brain evil. Yeah. <laughs> and, and this is something that anybody who writes often enough is going to come in, into, you know, this is this is a very typical problem that writers face. Mm-hmm. It is. It is. And now there I have two different ways that I go with this. And it depends on the story. So for me, and, you know, you can, you can jump in at any time here and say, well, I don't do that. But for me, if I have a solid idea of where I need the story needs to go at the end, okay, I have a very clear picture of where the end of the story is, which means generally I'm at the, in the middle of the book or later. Um, because at the beginning, it's generally all up for grabs for me. I think I might know the ending, but... It, it, that is that is so fluid at the beginning. By the time I've hit the middle of the book, I generally have a decent idea of where I think the book is going to end. And at that point, then I will go with the the idea that takes me closer to that ending. Um, whichever, whether it was the one that I had planned or whether it's the great new idea, the great shiny thing. Um, now, if... I don't yet have my ending, then I go for the shiny thing every time. Every time. The, the muse idea, if, if, it, if it genuinely feels good, now we're going to have to talk a little bit about feels good versus, you know, things that can lead you astray. But um, if the idea genuinely feels good and if it doesn't break just this kind of general floaty idea of story I want to tell that is in the back of my head I always go for the shiny thing so yeah yeah how about you well I, it's it's weird but I always have an idea in my head of the ending um I don't always know how to get there you know I know I will um but I've only written one or two things where I didn't have any idea how it was going to end um, and Glass House is one of those. But 
I mean, I had a vague idea of how I wanted it to end. Mm -hmm. um, usually I have a very strong ending. And a lot of times the ending is what has inspired me to write the book because I have this, this just really cool idea. So I'm sort of like the same in that I will usually, usually the ideas that my muse comes up with while writing fit the story better. Usually. That's helpful. Yeah. <laughs> Because it's like, oh, well, I have found a better way to do this. And I, I, you know, probably nine times out of ten, follow it. Sometimes, every now and then, I get this crazy out of nowhere idea. And I never put it down. I never say, oh, no, that's stupid. That won't fit. What I do is I open up uh, another draft or I open up, not another draft, I open up another page. Or now that I'm using Scrivener, I just open up like a tab that, mm -hmm. that'll say ideas if it's very specific to that one place I will put it in yellow and like highlight it and then also write in all caps the other idea that is possible because in revision you can change and fix anything and she's already said she's right. not afraid of changing it in revision which is really good yeah yeah that's if so, you can if you are at that point you're doing really well Yes. yes. Yeah, you're doing extremely well. You're you you've gotten past the the point where a lot of writers are um, struggling. Right. So if if you can look forward to revision and know, okay, I can change anything, then it's you you kind of feel freer to follow these new sparks of inspiration that pop up with your muse. But yeah, I always try to at least give my muse the the satisfaction of, okay, well, this is an idea I could follow if I run into something in the future. So I will write down that idea. I, a couple of times I've come back after several scenes I, I've written ahead. I realized, okay, no, it probably would have been better to use that idea. <laughs> so then I do what you do is I, I do that bracket TC colon I, uh, note no. To, to go back to the original idea, or, yeah. or not the original, but the new idea. And then I write from that point on as if I had made that change, as if I had gone with that extra idea. But it's because I have usually a pretty clear idea of the ending, a usually a pretty clear idea of a story. I know what's going to fit pretty well. And again, sometimes this is just experience and time. And sometimes as if as with holly writing dead man's party it's all about jumping on the weirdest shit <laughs> yes <laughs> you oh know? my god yes i have <laughs> i have the most bizarre issues with my endings because no matter i i i sometimes like becky sometimes i have a pretty good idea of where i think the story is going sometimes i just have and then i killed them all as my tact on ending sometimes I, I start the book with an idea of the ending that I want to write to, but it really doesn't matter because my muse plays this constant, incessant game with me of beat the ending, where mm -hmm. it's going to do stuff so that it can make an ending that's better than the one that I planned, and it won't tell me why. It won't tell me these, it, but it throws this stuff at me, and I chase it, and if I don't chase it, then I regret chasing it, because do you, you regret, regret not, not chasing, chasing it. it? Yeah, because because it I can see a little later where if I had done that thing, then this next thing that the muse did would have fit better, and I, and I don't go back, but I do put a TC in there, you know, go back to that point, put in a little bracket TC hyphen. This is what I should have done here, bracket, and then go back to the other thing. But um, I, I there are so many times I don't think I have ever actually written the ending that I'd planned. Mm -hmm. I, I, I can't think... Now, there might be one or two. There might be one or two where I actually somehow managed to get to the place where I thought I was going, but... But... I can't think of one. Yeah. Do you, and usually, I, I get them while I'm writing them. The actual it, ending. Usually, for me, it's the the ending is part of the inspiration for... The book in the first place yeah that's yeah, that it's, would be but, nice <laughs> writers i mean it's it's not necessarily it's just a different way of working you know yeah. that's the thing is 
is all writers find inspiration from different things and all writers have slightly different processes. We all run into a lot of the same, same problems, but we work so differently that it just, it makes writing this just amazingly unique experience, even if we are all running into a lot of the same problems. Yeah. Well, I mean, I will, I will have like a big block, like, well, I know the hero has to live to the end and I know the heroine has to live to the end. And that sometimes that's all I've got <laughs> because yeah. by the time I get to the end, everything else has changed. Yeah, um, see, with the house on Andrews Ave, it was very, very specific. I knew exactly what I wanted the ending to be. I knew the the house and the ending uh, were the inspiration. the The main villain were the inspiration, and it was it it worked out very differently the entire book was very different than i thought it was going to be which is completely normal Mm -hmm. but the ending um i feel like it was what i wanted oh Um, that's so cool yeah i want to try that sometime yeah (laughs) i want to actually see if i can think up an ending that i love so much well, it's that, not that it, I, that I think it up. Yeah. It's just it's that's that's the inspiration. A lot of people walk in with a story or walk in with a character they really want to explore or walk in with and and my process isn't necessarily different. It's just what has inspired me is different. And yeah. and it's the ending. It's it's the reveal, wow. you know. Yeah, I um, never have that. What is that we we brought this up? What is if it, the 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 thing you wanted to mention again, knowing that your story, knowing your story, mm-hmm. so you were talking about um, the twist if it fits the the story. Okay. So so remember you wanted to bring that up again. Right. You wanted to get into how does it feel? How does it does does it does it feel like it fits your story? Okay. So so at the point where you you're taking a chance here okay you've got this better idea but in order to get the better idea and use the better idea and chase the better idea or know if it genuinely is a better idea you do have to have some sort of a concept of the story you're trying to tell and we have mentioned this in another episode but we Mm -hmm. need to mention it again because it is a big damn deal um You need to know why you're writing the story because what, what matters about the story to you, are you writing it because it is this exquisite romance that you want to see realized in the world? Are you writing it because it is this exciting conceptual story of, of what if that is set in a future universe and that, that where some tiny change creates a horrific problem that then must be solved by people and that that you're kind of tying into something that you see in current day are you writing it because you want to scare the crap out of yourself at the ending yeah is it is it it's kind of like the the other way to say why are you writing this what matters to you is what inspired you to write it in the first place right right what is what is keeping you going right you're there you're there is some tiny kernel some tiny piece of this that that you love so much and that has built an entire world around it or it might be a tiny piece of a world that has built an entire bunch of characters and people around it but there's something what is that something you have to identify that and once you have identified the thing you love that you must stay true to which is, oh my God, I have to see these two poor people get together after all the horrific things I have done to them. Then you can look at potential changes and say, okay, well, this idea is going to kill off the hero. I probably shouldn't do that. Whereas if you just want to scare the crap out of people and and get them to an ending where they're turning pages and, and so scared that they aren't going to sleep for a week, well, killing the hero might work well for you. Yeah. And yeah, and then because then they're going, oh my God, what happens next? Yeah, the, this if, is if he was safe. If the main character, if the hero was was not safe, nobody's safe. Right. You know. Right. Is, Who, is well, the that person, the kind of? Yeah. Well, the person they thought was the main character. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. You, yeah. you 
if that is the idea, it, it, to keep your readers constantly on edge and guessing, thank you, George R. R. Martin, mm -hmm. <laughs> for killing Ned Stark. Oh, my God. <laughs> Spoiler. Evil but yeah, it's, it's just, it really does throw you for a loop. So is that your point? That is, is the point. Yeah. No, oh, I'm yeah. saying is is that That's your funny. point in writing the book is is what is your goal? What do you want to achieve with the novel? Right. Right. Um, or short another... story too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Or whatever you're writing. Right. Um, is is why why did you start writing it in the first place? And have you stayed true to that? And is the idea that your muse has thrown at you now, now something that is going to save it, or is it something that's going to break it? Yeah, breaking is exactly what I wanted to point out here, too. You want to yeah. make sure that it doesn't break anything within your story. Does it break character? Does it does it break the convictions of your character that they would never do? Does it break the, the storyline? Does it break the world? Mm -hmm. Like, I have very, very, very specific rules in my magic system that I'm building within Fulton Hills. I There are certain things that cannot happen. Right. So if if I have these really cool ideas, it's not that you can't use the ideas as well. And I wanted to point this out is if you're having an idea that seems just completely off the wall, let's say I, I've mentioned this before to other people, or I've mentioned this before on the podcast. I don't have aliens in Fulton Hills, mm -hmm. but let's say I wanted to have a UFO sighting. There is nothing that says I can't have people believe that it is a UFO sighting right. and chase that, that little weird dragon but again it can't actually be a ufo the the reader might not know that because they don't know my my very very specific rules right but, but you have to know it yes i have to know it and i also have to put in there another character to balance the alien thing out i have mm -hmm. to be able to show the reader that don't worry you know it, i think this is crazy too and i'm, I'm not saying that i believe aliens are crazy i actually believe in in extraterrestrials i don't think we're alone in this massive gigantic infinite space no. but um, i don't know that i believe they've gotten here i don't i i don't know enough yeah, but i will say we're way out on the fringe end of, of of a small spiral nebula out in the middle of nowhere so you know we're we're a long way from any neighbors <laughs> um but the 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 idea though is that you kind of want to balance out the the crazy. You you can chase a dragon <laughs> if it fits within your world. You can yeah. try to do those kind of red herring things where you're saying, "Oh, is the writer taking it this way?" Beautiful. It's not. It, it's it's fitting your world, and you're putting in a character that's saying, "Okay, well, I I might believe in aliens. I, I don't necessarily think this is an alien." Let me investigate further while everybody else is freaking out around them about, oh, my God, it was a UFO sighting. The other person is not sure, so they, they kind of, you know, dive into the mystery. That isn't breaking my world. Right. You have to be very careful about, okay, I like this part of the idea that you came up with, Muse. How can I make it fit the story? If you really, really want that new shiny idea, how can yeah. I make it fit my world? We have to say this again. The more strictly you hold to limitations, the tighter your story will be and the more compelling for the reader. Yeah, the and more, the better. Yeah, Just the better, better it will be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, we probably need to mention the, the little freebie download again, too. Um, yeah, and I'll put it in the link. Yeah. It's um, the five-minute world building. Yeah, five-minute world building. And it's on uh, the how to no, – the, the um, create a world clinic world building uh, class – sales page it's just in it's you don't have to sign up or anything it's just a free download right there yeah and you don't have to sign up you don't have to buy anything no, you don't have the, to buy anything it's just yeah. it's just i have it in a weird place because i wanted to show people before <laughs> they bought the class here five minutes and you have your first world yeah and yeah and, it was it's just it's a mom mom gives a lot of a, a lot of freebies away and you know and it's you know it seems counterintuitive but it, it, it well, shows people that she knows what she's talking about, and it it also we've we've been broke for we've so long. Broke. <laughs> yeah, we've been we've, so we've, broke. <laughs> we've had such bad years that any free information that we can find that will help us 
learn something. And I mean, I am a YouTube addict when it comes to fixing things. That's how I fixed my washer and dryer and computer and, and you know, mouse and everything and phones. I fixed my own phones because YouTube free information. I mean, you have to pay for the internet, <laughs> but yeah. in one way or another, you can go to the library, I guess, but then you got gas. It, it's the, the idea is that you can build a world, you, you can keep to your limitations, and you can play with these ideas. Just because the muse shoots out some shiny new weird idea that you, you think is not appropriate for your story, it's all about asking the right questions, which Holly is big into. Mm -hmm. And what you can ask yourself, if you're sitting there thinking, well, this is a cool idea, but it's not right for this story, you can either write it down and give your muse the pleasure of knowing, listen, I'm listening to you. This is a cool idea. It doesn't work. Or you can say, okay, I'm listening to you. How do we make this fit my story? Right. So right. is there anything else that you wanted to say on that particular question? I, I don't think so. I, I think it, it comes down to... You, you take a chance, you, you make sure that you have the background, the basis um, of understanding your story to take the chance. You trust your muse to not lead you in bad directions. And if it does, you, you still, you know, you've, you've saved backups. So yeah. you can always roll back. Well, plus, um, I mean, if you're yeah. constantly making these notes that you suggest people make, these these bracket TC, I mm -hmm. use a colon, you use a hyphen, and then the information, you can find the place where you, quote, broke your story. Right. So, and, and you, the question owner, whoever you are, the question writer, you are so far, a, 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 like, advanced, I guess, as far as the ability to sit here and say, I'm not afraid to change it in revision, mm -hmm. that that gives you so much freedom yeah. within your own limitations of the world that you have no idea how, how well you're doing. So you can feel free to chase these crazy dragons that your muse is, is spouting out at you, all of these pretty shiny things. And conflict early on is not bad. You can continue to grow conflict if you're listening to your muse and your muse is giving you conflict. That's amazing. Like real actual conflict. Again, you are doing so well. You, you, you're past a lot of these little points where we run into when we're starting writing. Right. The that, every word is perfect syndrome. Yeah. And I mean, there's so many syndrome. The, the, I don't know what conflict is. I don't know what goes in a scene. Mm -hmm. I don't. I, I am having trouble creating conflict because people have the, you know, the argument is conflict mm -hmm. problem. Yeah. So you're doing really well. If, if you're at the point where your muse is throwing you all of these different things, just always ask yourself, okay, how do I, how can I make this fit my story? And then make a notation in your first draft so you know where you need to fix it if, if it ends up that <laughs> it, you did go wrong. Yes. And then And sometimes you can, they do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes it, but, it's like like your FBI agent. Yeah, they're words. Nobody's gonna die if you break a few. Yeah, and then when you realize it went wrong, make a notation in in the novel, and then go back to how it should have been in the first place. Right. And then you can always fix it later. Yeah. You, you're at a really good point with your work right now. So I guess um, we go to the next question then. Yeah. So the next question we have is: I'm ready to start drafting my novel. And I'm wondering about word count. I'm coming from a flash background and usually draft 300, 500, 300 to 500 word scenes initially that get expanded in revision. At that rate, I may need up to five scenes a week and I'm worried about getting through my story too fast or padding it with unnecessary scenes just to hit the minimum word count. Should I expand each scene as I go in, <laughs> as I go in order to get the word count or not worry as much about word count and just try to get the story down first. I know this is coming up in a later lesson. I guess she's taking one of your courses, but I'm facing it now. So I thought I'd ask. Thank you so much, both for the class and the live stream. So if she already has the answer now, this is still an important thing that yeah. other people are going to be running into. Yeah. Um, and, and Becky is watching me sitting over here with my head exploding as she's yes, reading out she's, the question. Yeah, she's just antsy to, to answer oh. this question. She's dying right now yeah. to, to, to fix some thoughts in oh. this. 
God because the devil word from hell rolled its way through that question. And Becky <laughs> read it with a straight face and didn't scream. Yep. And I'm going, no, 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 no. Yeah. Pad. The word is pad. Yes. pad. I knew it too. I knew it was driving oh. mom nuts too. Never fucking pad anything ever. Yes. Never, never, never pad. Now, is, I did oh. want to mention one thing. Yeah. Holly has this really cool article, and I'm going to link it in the show notes. And it is about word count. It is about word count math. Mm-hmm. And it's it's a brilliant, nice little basic thing and you don't have to stick to it exactly you don't have to say okay well every single chapter has to be 1200 words it is just a guideline but it is an excellent way to sit there and say okay well i'm shooting for this line they want 90,000 words for this book let me break it down and figure out what i need so i'm going to link that in the show notes for anybody there's a couple of really really big problems with this question pad is one of them had pad is try is not to grind them. your teeth there yes. holly but yes. it's yeah we need to address a couple of problems with this okay so the the first problem is a conceptual one where the writer is looking at this and is ta- is moving from writing flash fiction 350 word scene stories 300 to, to 500 words yeah well yeah, yeah. 300 but Scenes. yeah 300 to 500 yeah um is moving from writing these flash fiction sized stories to thinking of writing 500 word scenes and doing them as an outline. And what that is, is that's called an extended outline. It's something that I used to have to put together for my editors when I was doing um, three chapters and a synopsis proposals, or you would write three full chapters and then you would write um, one paragraph or or 300 to 500 words of a scene per scene of what was going to be in the scene and that for me at least was the most soul deadening soul crushing horrific experience possible because after you have done that you have effectively written the book and then to go back in and write those scenes at length your muse says i've already done this I have yeah. already done this. I've done with this book. I never want to see this shit again. It's it's like talking out your story to people. For, yeah. For a lot of writers, that kills the drive to write it because you've already gotten the response. You've already gotten, the muse has already gotten the, the candy at the end of the maze. So yeah. why why go through it again? Yes. I, I told it to, my, to, I told my story idea to somebody. The person liked it. Bing. Okay, done. On to the next idea because that one worked. Somebody liked it. Yeah. See, so you don't you don't do that either, but <laughs> so you don't talk about your story ideas with people. Not not you don't talk about your 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 how your writing is going with people, um, and and you don't yeah you you want so I I think this person was kind of semi aware of the problems because yeah. they even say I'm coming from a fl- hold on I'm coming from a flash background and then she also says or, or he I don't know um, right worried about padding. You know, so they're worried about padding, which which is definitely a no. Right. So, yeah, that's so I am I am hitting all of these things really hard for the people who don't have any sort of a background. Yeah. Um, because well, if the next problem is padding, why don't you describe what padding is for maybe beginning writers or anybody who's coming in and they just don't understand the mm-hmm. term? Padding is where you have um a scene and it comes in too short so you go back through and you look for all the places where you could describe things a little bit more in depth and like yeah the character her dress her hair her boobs um her voice her eyes and or you you put in something where the character is just thinking about all the events Mm -hmm. that have happened recently or you add a scene where she goes to a, a bookstore and you know is actively moving and interacting with people, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't count towards the story. Something right. like that. Nothing. Nothing actually happens. It just. It shows you she's drinking coffee. Um, the the character and her boyfriend are just talking about what happened yesterday. Uh, the character and her boyfriend are talking about what they want to do tomorrow. Um, or she, you, you see this scene from her where she's driving to work or she's at work or she's working. Right. I mean, there there can be action in padding scenes. 
it, it's like, okay, well, well, I guess I need another subplot. Let me put the subplot in that doesn't make any sense or doesn't fit the story. So you have right. like, oh, she finds a kitten and she raises the kitten and she keeps the kitten or she gives it away. And it has nothing to do with the murder mystery, but it's padded. It's, it, it feels like it adds a little bit of character, but it doesn't. It doesn't. It takes right. away from the story. Right. You know, if if the, the kitten then um, tracks through a fresh body, uh, mm-hmm. thra- tracks through the blood or comes home with it and, and has blood on his paws. Well, a, cat, a cat wouldn't do that, but it has Or if a cat, blood. yeah, or a cat, like, um, spills all of her paperwork and it ends up leading her to the clue because the mm-hmm. clue's on top and she's like, how did I miss this? Yeah, and there's or, a little bloody put- kitten footprint on it or something. Or Well, see, I, I just, I'm not sticking with the blood thing. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> if the cat somehow adds to that that story that's different but if it's just a complete other storyline that you think is going to just add a a level of depth to the character but Mm -hmm. it gets its own scenes and it's nothing but that and it doesn't have anything to do with the plot right that that is padding padding. yes that is bad 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 padding and and um it is it is the beginner solution to so many things unfortunately um yeah, and don't feel bad if you've done it. Right, We're no. saying it's bad, but we're not insulting you or any of the other writers. We're just saying that this is something that all of us run into. This is something that everybody who's ever written has run into. I got my so, worst reject. well, my, my most useful rejection slip ever from a story that was, was kill, almost, nearly killed the editor. It was the much, 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 too much exposition rejection slip from uh, Charles C. Ryan. And there's another example of padding, exposition. Yes. If you exposition. start off, yeah, this is another thing that I've run into many times reading other people's work, is that they think they have to put the entire history in there. Uh-huh. They introduce a character and they give their entire <clears throat> history. They introduce another character, give their entire history. Yeah, that is going to give you word count, absolutely. Oh. The entire history, the entire description of the character, you know, the entire history of the world and how this character interacted with the world oh, and yeah. other characters. Oh. Yeah. It's it'll pad it'll give you that word length but it's not good and And there is yeah there is this thing in the back of your head that says i really need to put this in to to explain to the reader how this works because if they don't know how this works they're not going to get the rest of the story and so you write in this massive piece of of complicated stuff that you worked out on how the culture works or how the religion works or how something else works here's the thing you need to know it yes but the the reader does not need to know this they need to not know it they yeah. specifically need to wonder what are these crazy people in the white skirts and the purple headdresses doing with dancing around in this circle naked with 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 their their skirts and their their topless and their purple hats and it's what? something that is a slow reveal you can learn yeah. that later you so uh, things that a lot of writers run into is when they're writing they need to figure something out they need to figure out how something works so they will write this entire thing out and then they'll think, well, I needed to know it, so the reader needs to know it. No, you needed to know it. It's great that it's there. That's why there's a first draft for things. Yeah, and you genuinely to need cut. to know it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You, you and, and a lot of writers write that way where they have to figure something out, and you can see them figuring it out on the page. But the reader does not. The reader very, very much, like you said, does not need to know because mm-hmm. it needs to be that you need to leave the reader asking questions constantly. Another thing with the description, with the padding with description, um, it's better to let the the reader have a visual in their own mind of what somebody looks like, including um, evil villains or bad guys or something. You can throw a couple of little words in there, and some of our flash fiction stories this year for Halloween did an amazing job with that. But I find it scarier if I'm reading a horror movie and I don't, or reading a horror movie, reading a horror book and I don't know exactly what the thing looks like. If there's just little tiny details. Seriously. Because your your imagination will fill in what terrifies you. Right. And that's, that's exactly that. And this also brings us to the George C. Clooney problem, which is something else that people throw in that's padding, which is... Um, they need 
the reader to see, they think they need the reader to see what they're seeing. So they will write in, um, uh, yes, uh, the, the heroine looked like George C. Clooney. And, you know, mm-hmm. he was, or he, he had George Why do you C- say C? It's well, yeah. just George Is it George Clooney? Clooney? I don't know. I don't know why. George, um, okay. I don't even think he has a There might name. not be a George C. Clooney. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I, it's, it's, I thought maybe George C. Clooney was a writer, but no, George no. Clooney, or yeah, he looks like the, Brad the actor, Pitt. Yeah, where, where authors will use actors or current celebrities or um, current politicians or current whatever it is that they're really into yeah and they think is really hot or really or really hideous yeah or hideous. really evil yes. and they will use these people in their book and instantly instantly you are going to piss off somebody because um i i have read numerous romance novels where the hero is described as george as george clooney you know, or he or, looks like yeah. a young George Clooney or um, a blonde George Clooney or whatever. And I fucking cannot stand George Clooney. Cannot stand the the actor. Cannot. I, I just. I, See, there I are like just him. Some, but I know. There are it's, just it's, some people who make your hackles rise. I don't know why I don't like him. I don't know anything about him that I find disturbing. It's just every time I see his face, I can't stand him. And I don't know why, but I can't. So and this when, is this is not even about not finding that, okay, no. well, Holly wouldn't be your person. This isn't right. about the... It, it. Some people could just roll their eyes because they don't want to imagine George Clooney. But for me, that kills the book. If you want, though, to have a, a certain aspects of George Clooney in your character, you can say whatever it is that you like about him. If you like right. his eyes, put, put in something about... He has whatever kind of eyes, whatever you think about him. Um, with with my characters, I would I would put in things that are important to me, but I'd also kind of leave them vague. He has kind eyes, a rugged jaw, you know. Somebody else has a different version in their mind of what those look like. To right. me, a rugged jaw wouldn't be necessarily the same thing to somebody else. So, yeah. you don't want to go overboard in that description, right? Because you're you're, you're you're going to kill it for a lot of people, not just not your readers, not just Holly, who, who doesn't like George Clooney and you adore him, but a lot of your readers don't want that much information. Right. And there is a second problem with using celebrities, famous people, groups, mm-hmm. of whatever. Um, this is dated shit. These guys get older. They die. If your books are still out there. And you have somebody who is looking like um, Myrna Loy, you know, let's say somebody back in the day. That's really old. Oh, my God, yes. And you're reading a book and some person way back in, what, the 40s, maybe? I don't know when Myrna Loy was was famous. but 20s or something. Maybe the 20s or 30s. Yeah, Silence. I don't know. I I just remember, this is a name of an actress that I know can't put a face to, but I remember the name for a reason I can't even explain. She was smoky and hot. But yeah, I I completely understand what you're saying. Yeah, you you understand that this is somebody, but if you say, oh yes, she was was, um, a perfect Myrna Loy goddess, and everybody goes, oh? Yeah, unless you're a movie what? buff. Or you're writing a period piece for people who like yes. that period, who you can expect, if they know the crap from that period, are going to know who Mo- Myrna Loy is. But yeah. see, as you are putting this stuff into your books now, people are going to be picking them up later, especially if you're indie publishing and you can keep your stuff in print, is mm-hmm. what you are writing now is going to be out there for a really long time time and stuff that you think now you know the 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 person that you can't stand and want to be the the stand in for your villain or the person that you adore who is going to show up as a rapist 15 years from now or just some hideous thing if you're using real people as examples um you know you're you're going to have the 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 dad cosby issue i was about to say i was just about to bring up cosby or kevin spacey yes you know we loved those guys yeah and yeah and then and then the 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 fault of being you know evil 
it pops up and then it ruins anything that they might have been mentioned in or any work that they have done. You watch work that they have done and you cringe. You can't watch it anymore because you know too much. Right. So any of your work, you don't know these celebrities. You just know who's hot now. This is another thing that people do is they try to find people that are hot now that other people will oh, like. God. So it helps sell their fiction. But it's like. Yeah, you just put a burn date in your book. Yeah. Well, Jason Momoa might be hot now. It might grab people's attention but with social media with the way everything works now 15 minutes he could be he could be a nobody again yeah the, although the tweeny I boppers that, the, the i don't know the the guys who appeal to teenagers that bieber guy just yeah bieber. that's the one yeah i was trying that's, to think of him I kept yeah because you made the hair gesture, the hair gesture. yeah yeah because you know because you know he's limited he's unless he can go big he's I mean, got he's a already shelf- Oh, he's, he's already already, his shelf big. life has already passed? No, he's already gone big. He's changed his music. Okay. He still has a lot of fans. But, I mean, he, he, you don't know if he's going to be something like... I mean, even the Rolling Stones, people will ask, like... I mean, they had a really long shelf life, but they and still have... still around. Yeah, but... they still have a shelf life. Right. Y- you... We're going on a bit long about this, but basically... Don't use celebrities. Don't you? And, and there are always exceptions, mm-hmm. and we've mentioned some of them. But it, at this point, <laughs> Moses is probably safe. If you're Christian, <laughs> well, yeah, you know. But if you are, if you're using Moses, you probably know the audience you're writing to. And at yeah. this point, Moses is probably safe. Um, and you know, you might get you get might get somebody Gandhi. from. Mother Teresa, yeah, Buddha. There you go. Yeah. You've yeah. you've got a bunch of, of historical figures that you can use. Yeah. Um, but yeah. So as far as coming from the flash fiction background thing where you are drafting these three to five hundred word scenes that you think will be expanded in revision that's not going to help you because it's gonna crush your soul. It yeah. is going to make you as you are trying to write those scenes that you have already written in a good form in 350 words into something that's 12 to 2400 words, it is going to crush your soul because you've already told this story once. So here are some things to do instead of that. And this is, you know, walk away from the flash fiction model now. This is do something different. Once you know the things that you need to know from flash fiction, which is how to write a beginning, a middle, an end, and a twist, and a good title that ties in with your story. That's the five best basic things you get from flash fiction. It's time to move on. Um, what you need to do now is identify and break out your important conflicts. And you know what's an important conflict? Um, if you are writing a novel-length story. You not you don't just have one big conflict because with flash fiction you've got one conflict. Yeah. Okay. Now that changes with a longer story, with a twelve hundred to twenty four hundred word story, which can have three or four scenes in it. You can have a one big conflict and a smaller conflict. You know, you can have. And again, these are generalizations, but yeah. still, that that's it's just the basic model. Yeah, and then moving up to a novella or a novel. Yeah. Y- then you've got your big conflict. And then some subplots. Right, you have subplots. Like, okay, let's just throw something together here. The big conflict is a murder mystery. Somebody is killing um, 50-year-old women uh, who wear glasses. <laughs> okay. You know, just as the, it's, it's, a, it's a cozy Okay, and it, we so we have a bunch of suspects, and we already know we're going to have seven suspects because you know there are always a bunch. There are always people who look likely. We have, and three of them are going to be um, fifty-year-old women who wear glasses because we have to have those those cozy people who end up dead. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of them is going to be somebody who isn't because they saw somebody getting killed. Um, so, you know, that's all of our four suspects right there, but you're going to be telling stories from only the point of view of the detective in most cases, the, well, the sleuth, Mm -hmm. because they're rarely in cozies. They're rarely ever a detective. Yeah. Yeah. They're usually 
a, a homebody or whatever. So then you're going to have not just the story of people dying, where that's the main plot, is people are dying, who's doing it and why. You're also going to have conflicts that the main character has with uh, various of the people uh, who end up dead with, that she thought were suspects first because they were, they were doing bad things that she found out while she was investigating them, but it turns out they didn't do it because they end up dead. Mm -hmm. And then you have um, like some, some small personal ongoing story if, if you're doing a, a, a series sequential or series. Whatever. Yeah. Yeah. You could have conflict with the sleuth daughters or, yeah. or sons or work. Repeating recurring best friend character comes in or, mm -hmm. yeah, or work or, you know, the bakery is not doing well if she's a baker uh, or, yeah. or she's having you a problem have... getting sugar and she's having to go to corn syrup or. <laughs> yeah. You can have some sort of little side conflict that adds to the conflict in ways like if her business is failing she she's trying to work and, and get money but at the same time she's trying to solve the problem of the right. murder so yeah it, that's another conflict in there and that of is course helping she's going to become a target of the yeah. the killer as it's, it becomes apparent that she is investigating this the killer is going to want to find a way to get rid of her too because she's getting close so, you know, that's another one. But yeah, you're, you are, you have multiple, multiple intertwining stories that all feed the main story, that are all relevant to the main story, that all matter to the main story, but they bring different angles to it. So they're not padding. And, okay, and then after that, the next approach you can take to this is you just ask yourself, well, what happens? And then you write out um, just a sentence for each potential scene in the book. One sentence. And we go through this a lot. Protagonist yeah. versus ag antagonist in a setting with a twist. And you write out why you want to do this. Um, you know, what, what you want to have happen, but just in one sentence, because that does not kill your muse. That and if, it, if you're having trouble writing longer scenes, um, it's, it's a good idea to go back into some of your favorite novels, longer ones if you want. Read the scenes written by your favorite novelist or writers. God, yes. And just see kind of look at it from a writer's perspective and see how much they put into and again a favorite because you want to read something that was written well you, you want an example of scenes done well not scenes with padding not scenes with problems and as you're reading them you you kind of get an idea of what is important of what makes the scene really fascinating of what the writer included and also didn't include that what what the writer kind of of left when you read a scene get to the point where you're, where you're asking questions and say okay well oh okay this scene made me ask this question this scene showed me this but is also hiding that especially if you've read the book before it it really does help it's like okay well that leads to this but they're hiding it. So it, it gives you an idea of not just how to write longer scenes, but also what you need to include in scenes to pique the interest of the reader. That is a really, really good suggestion. And I would like to add just a tiny bit to that. If you are having a problem figuring out how protagonist versus antagonist with twist works, in a setting with a twist, yeah. It is a really good idea to write down that for each scene. And find books you just love. Yeah. And then write down their protagonist, their conflict, their antagonist, their setting, and their twist per scene. And see just exactly how much is in each scene and what's, and how they make it interesting. And, and how they move you from the beginning of the scene to the the resolution they needed to get for that scene to take you to the next one 
Um, and if you are having questions as far as packs, uh, and especially the twist, because the twist is not always what you think it is. We did an episode on the twist, so I will link that in the show notes. Go listen to that before you start running through people's scenes, because you might get to the end and say, oh, well, there was no twist. The twist is the thing that changes, and we go into a lot of detail with this in our episode. So go listen to that episode and keep in mind what you have learned when you go through their scenes and try to find all of the packs. Not Now, some of them, like Holly has a um, an example, Chip, I'm pregnant, a bit of dialogue. <laughs> yes. So you, you don't necessarily find every single aspect of packs in that scene. There's no setting. There, there, there's an implied setting if you're reading the book in order, but there's no exact setting. Yeah, because they were in a room in the previous scene. He mm-hmm. was talking to the girlfriend in the previous scene, and then there is this this scene where it's just Chip, I'm pregnant. Yeah. But, so you get the room from the previous scene, you get the girlfriend from the previous scene as the antagonist in this case, because he was not happy to find out that she was pregnant. Um, you get the protagonist, although it's, but it's implied. She's implied, yeah. he's implied. So y- yeah. you just have to know... Like, Chip is obviously, you know, he's the protagonist, mm-hmm. she's the antagonist, there's there's a twist, um, and there's a versus. There's just no particular setting for that particular scene. So right. if you're writing things down, that one will miss out. But, but the majority of scenes in really well-written books that we love and we want to read again will have all five. While you are doing this, you are going to, in order to not pad, in order to make your story matter more to you you're going to ask yourself what happens we just went through that you are then going to ask yourself what else could happen what else that fits within this story that i want to tell that i haven't thought of yet what else could happen what else uh, who else might be involved if you're writing a longer story it's not probably going to be just two characters it's probably and you know that's all you have room for in in flash fiction Uh, you can have other people in there but your conflict is is very tiny it's one change in a novel your conflict is big and expansive and has multiple parts that keeping move it moving so you ask who else might be involved can you create another character who actually ties into the conflict or who, another red herring or whatever yeah. it is that your genre is right it's it's you're constantly looking for ways to kind of change it up and and add more conflict mm-hmm. this this next one is a truly evil question i love it i love it i love it beyond words it is What isn't the reader seeing? And this is where you look through what you've written and you identify an object in the scene or you identify some some little background noise you wrote about in the scene or you identify an animal in the scene or something and you say, okay, that's in there and it's in there for a reason. Why is that in there? Why is this little thing that I just threw in there for color? It secretly and and let's say it's a button. You just you just drop the button on the floor. A nice shiny little copper button. Why is there a button on the floor? And the button turns out later to be a clue. It turns this is- this is something that Holly goes into more detail with the how to revise your novel course. Oh yeah. But this is what she calls toys on the floor. Exactly. And if you're looking to expand your scene and also you, you don't you don't want to go back through and pad that bit and make it more obvious that the 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 button is important. God but no. it's a great way to expand further scenes because you've got this this little mystery now. Right. If you allow yourself to just write some little details into scenes and not have any reason for them being there, by the time you go back and do your revision, then you find these things and the, and you look at them and you go, oh my God, that's already in there. And that's going to be the button that the killer dropped from his sweater in, and that's going to show up in the last scene when he's going to be wearing the sweater and the button is still missing. And that's how she's going to know it's him. And there, bam, there it is. 
all of a sudden you've got goosebumps because now all of a sudden you have this perfect thing that the reader sees in like scene three that doesn't show up until scene 37 and you look brilliant yeah because but you didn't know until you went back and started revising that that was even in there because it was just this little piece of something that you threw on the floor to have something in there that sparkled but we we don't also we don't want to to say you know do this just during revision if you are are struggling with making your scenes longer right. you can go back and read a couple of scenes remember don't revise don't don't fix misspellings or anything like that just kind of read and see what perks your muse interest say yeah. ask your question what secret is in here that i don't know about what what are you hiding from me that i need to know right and then just pick it up in your next chapter yeah yeah something you because you're you're muse if you are allowing yourself to write a little longer if you're giving yourself a little bit of elbow room to throw in some light description to throw in some noises and backgrounds to to make sure that you make the setting feel real for the reader you know light um the patterns of light on the floor or the time of day or just this little shit you throw in because your muse says hey you know let's let's put purple wallpaper on the wall just for the hell of it then when you go back there's a reason why there's purple wallpaper on the wall that previously it wasn't purple it's because there was somebody who was killed there there was blood on the wall and the person covered the wall with purple wallpaper so that uh, yeah well yeah i wallpapered isn't that nice it looks i needed to freshen up the room yeah 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 and and, and that can can lead to something else so yes. just just any of the description that you put in any of the little details you can pull out and and again, like Holly said, you end up looking brilliant mm -hmm. because you and, and part of it is your muse is pretty brilliant because it chose that object to make deeper. Yeah. It just it makes you look like you had this planned all along. And right. it's, it's one of those secrets of writers that, you know, we all have the capacity to 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 have that that little secret where we're no, we didn't plan it. It just it just our muse picked up on it and helped me make me look brilliant but if anybody asks yeah i planned that <laughs> <laughs> sure i knew from the very beginning that that tiny little thing over there was going to be the key to the whole thing. no i didn't know <laughs> i didn't know i just did that in revision man <laughs> so what else is there okay so then there is the final question the last thing that i'm going to recommend is that you ask yourself as you are writing and as you are reading through the stuff that you have been writing, what am I not seeing? What am I not seeing that I need to be seeing? And this is, where is the thing that I love not showing up in what I'm writing so far? You know, when you look at it, are you seeing this, the, the building conflicts of a deep romantic relationship? Or are you seeing um, little bits and pieces of what might be potential clues in previous chapters. Are you giving yourself enough room to build out? Are you, are you putting enough detail into what you're writing to give yourself some things to play with later? Um, yeah. Do you have enough characters? Do you have a pet? Do you have, are your, are your sex scenes hot enough? If you're, if you're writing sex scenes and you want to write something that makes people's toes curl, um, you know, when you read them back, are you going, oh, my God? Or are you going, well, yeah, no, that's not bad. That's, you know, because it's got to work for you. And once your muse has had a chance to get a little cold on the material, when you go back, it has to be fresh to you. It has to hit you the way it hits the person who's eventually going to read it. So, you know, give yourself a little time. And then go back and reread the stuff that you have previously written and just see if what you want to see is already there or if going forward, not, not in the stuff that you would have to go back and tinker with, don't touch first draft, but in the, in the next few scenes, can you get a little bit more of what you want to see into what you're doing now? And th there's something to this too that holly is always saying that it's easier to cut than add so you you want to tend to write long and and you can always 
go through with a red pen during your oh, revision. Absolutely. The other thing is have patience. Longer novels, when it comes to writing flash fiction, it's a lot of fun. It's very fast. It's fast paced. It's okay. I got to cut this word, cut that word. I got to make this trim. I got to make this lean. And it's all about getting all of that in there and the twist in fast. When it comes to writing novels or novellas or even longer stories, if you're looking at short stories, you have to have patience, not just with yourself. But with the words, with the scenes, you, you have to kind of ask yourself, okay, what else can I include that isn't padding? What if I, if I go back to the scene that I just wrote and read it real quick, what am I missing? Am I missing a sense of place? Am I missing, um, is it just talking heads? Oh God. Am I missing action? Am I missing a, 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 an atmospheric feel? What can I do while the scene is still fresh to increase my own perspective my own involvement in this in this you know scene how can I make it more thrilling ask yourself the right questions like Holly always says you know what what do I feel like is missing why am I not intrigued enough what else can I add what secret like mom says what secret is the news hiding yeah the the one wrong question and this is the evil wrong question from hell is how can I increase my word count yeah. don't ever ask that yeah. but but but, um, but the, know the the right questions yeah. that will end up increasing your word count yeah and I'm going to run through them one more time what happens what else could happen who else might be involved what isn't the reader seeing and what aren't you seeing? I've heard you caution against name and shame several times, and I was wondering if you could explain this policy on the show. My gut always thinks that this silence allows bad or sort of bad people to continue to do things without repercussions. I worry that it's the kind of thing that makes it easier for predators in the workplace and in parentheses, obviously not the topic you are advocating silence on. I'm not saying that, but it has a similar feel to me. Out of parentheses. <laughs> or for people who pirate books to be allowed into Facebook reader groups instead of being banned as they would be if people knew that they were the sort to download pirated material. In no way do I advocate drama, and I'm a firm believer in not my circus, not my monkeys. But when the <laughs> issue is real as yours have been on the show, not a slight or insult, how do you keep to your rule? Or I guess my real question is, why? I am totally confident there is a reason I'm just too ignorant to see. I'm not questioning morals or anything. I just need a little help understanding if there's a reason other than a possible possibility of a future libel suit. And if that is the main reason, is that possibly worse than I think it is? <laughs> There's there's a lot to unpack here. Yeah, this is this is a big question. So we'll just take um, it point by point, I think. Okay. Um and just to just to separate these because we talk a lot about books that we don't like or you know, if it we promote the books that we do like and we don't name names when it comes to the books that we don't like. Um Holly and I just we don't believe in putting more negative out there so a lot of um people might think okay well name and shame so we're not because we use the same terms on someone who has done something negative in the past to both of us as when it comes to writing and fiction and and other writers and stuff like that we don't we're not one star review leavers no we're we're not that kind of person. I, I think maybe when I was younger, I had left a couple and I used to be more critical and negative. It is harder to create than it is to criticize. So that's, that's not what we're going to be talking about here. Um, but I just wanted to put that in there is that we don't mention the negative books or the books that are, in our opinions, not great, except for a couple of, you know, ones that we have have brought up like um, uh, Twilight, you know, or, or you know, and, and like I've said many times, it's just my opinion. Or E.L. James's um, Twilight fan fiction knockoff that became really Yeah, the really million, popular. billionaire thing. I don't remember the yeah, name of it right offhand, the, but. The bonkers. <clears throat> yeah, well, see, I can't was... even comment on that one because I didn't read it because that's yeah. just not my interest. Well, again, but again too, yeah. 
it's all about the readers. It's all about perception. You might love those books, and that's great, and I'm not shitting on you for it. And that's the, that's the thing. I'm not shitting on Stephanie Myers, Myers for writing her thing. I just, that was my opinion. But, again, most books I'm not going to name out. I'm not going to call out any authors. I'm not going to say anything like that. Most of the times, if we do use an author's name, it's just as kind of an example. Yeah, we use this. We something. like this. It's. I would recommend this to somebody who likes this sort of thing because I liked it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and that's the, so with the name and shame. This is this is just we're we're just saying like right off the bat. This we're talking about something else when it comes to other writers. We are not people who generally shit on authors. No, no. Um, I grew up with this very simple rule: if you don't have something good to say, don't say anything. And. <laughs> Where books are concerned and where other people's yeah. creativity is concerned, that is still my rule. Uh, I will give four and five star reviews if, if the book, and I read a shitload of books, if the book did not earn either four or five stars from me, I won't recommend, I, I just won't say anything at all because it's not my job. It, I can look at it and say, okay, well, somebody else liked it. Let them talk about it. Let them talk about why they liked yeah. it. I didn't, but my opinion on something crappy is my opinion, and my opinion doesn't need to count when there are people who actually like this work. So let the people who like it explain why. Yeah, like I could, I could definitely talk to somebody, like a friend or something, and explain why I didn't, I wasn't crazy about something. But I'm not going to tear something apart. In, you know, and I, I used to do this when I was younger. So, I, you know, people grow and people change and people adapt and they evolve and they, you know, hopefully you get better as you get older. But I, I just, it, there's so much negativity in the world already. There's so many people shitting on creatives. There's so many people mm -hmm. shitting on, on everybody all over. You don't need to add to that, to that list, I think. Right. If you um, are I, someone who is creative, what the fuck yeah. are you doing? Yeah. Knock it I off. I, I honestly appreciate honest reviews. Mm -hmm. Like, I will read the three-star reviews because they generally cover the pros and cons. And then I will buy the book and leave my own, you know, three, four, or five star. Usually it's four or five. So, like, I don't bother if it's – if it, I tend to not to bother if it's lower. Right. Uh, three generally is a very good book that was really shitty edit, editing or really <laughs> just all sorts of typos and shit. But – it's just, it's it's hard enough as it is, and your opinions and, and what you like, it's subjective. You know, it's based on your own life experiences and the things that you are into. Like Holly says, don't, if you're writing sci-fi, don't have romance readers read your sci-fi. Have sci-fi readers read your sci-fi. So it's this, it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. So let's go ahead and get into the, into the question and our answer on the other end of the spectrum. On the other end, which is um, people who are doing things that could be seen as wrong. Um, first off, again, innocent until proven guilty is my standard. And I am not someone who is legally qualified to prove guilt. So... If I see something that is wrong, I can mention that something I can see that something that is wrong. I will not mention who is doing it because I, if I can't prove it, then I can just say, look, this looks like a problem. Um, now with, with Patreon, they had a shitty terms of service and yeah. I could point out specifically how their, their terms of service were different in the rights that they claimed than uh, Kofi, Co coffee. coffee. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. But also, also notice that we never said that that Patreon did anything. We never no. pa said Patreon stole anybody's work or created the derivative, uh, the um, derivatives, and and are creating work and selling work based off of somebody else's stuff. And that's fuck. Then that's wrong. Right. All we pointed out was what Patreon's terms of service allows them to do if they wanted to in the future right. and it's bullshit right 
Right. So I did not leave because they had done anything wrong to me. I did not leave because they had done anything wrong to anybody else that I know of. Um, aside from, I think, closing down some people's accounts for differences of political opinion, I, uh, yeah, I think. But I think, but yeah, that, I didn't that even would, That always bothered you, but you didn't leave for that. No, I, I left because their terms of service, it is not what they do, but what they can do. And could and what the they could do, that. yeah, could yeah. could what they could do be what I consider unethical? And the answer to that question was yes. Not that they did anything wrong, that they could have done something wrong. So yeah, we were always very careful about that. Yeah, I mean, and and it's not that we were intentionally careful. It's just that that's us as human beings is that we're not gonna, you know, say something has happened that has not. Mm -hmm. And I think that each individual is responsible for what they put out there. Yeah. So if, if you are someone who jumps on somebody else because of what somebody else said they did, and they get crushed because of this piling on of people acting not on what was proven, not proven guilt, you know? Bill Cosby, yeah, that's proven. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's proven. That's guilty. We can name names there. But if somebody says somebody else did this, if it's just hearsay, I will not have a part of that yeah. because you can destroy innocent people by doing that. You, if you do not personally know firsthand from having experienced it yourself, that there was something wrong, that was something legally actionable that was done, then um, you have no business saying anything. If yeah. you don't know and don't have proof, you sit by quietly until the people who do have proof come out with it. I and had... remember too, there's always two sides to every story. Right. So even with these videos that go viral, a lot of people are just having a bad damn day, yeah. you know, and, and maybe they shouldn't have been recorded at the time. Right. And but, camera angles can, can, yeah. um, hide a world of dishonesty. Yeah. Now there is an episode of, um, Malcolm in the middle where they catch, uh, the cop pulls her over, gives her a ticket for making, uh, like, uh, driving recklessly or something. And the entire episode, you're seeing everything everything from the camera angles say it's true and she says no it's it's not i know i didn't do this well at the very end they've pulled a tape from the gas station across the street and it shows that no she was absolutely 100 percent correct she was not driving recklessly and the husband and sons destroy the tape because <laughs> because yeah oh. because she had been she started being nice and not so much of a know-it-all oh. so they're like your mother can never know <laughs> oh that's evil but yeah, okay awesome. i'm going to use harvey weinstein as an example here mm -hmm. uh because you know now now we have proof there was a woman who caught him on her cell phone threatening her if she did not offer him sexual favors he yes. was going to make sure she never worked in hollywood again and she got the bastard on film or on on cell phone yeah cell phone yeah at which point this became undeniable up to that point it was a lot of piling on and a lot of people jumping in who knew absolutely nothing about it and you know, yeah, he it deserved destroys... to lose his job. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's the same thing with with um, with Bill Clinton. You know, uh, an intern says, "Oh, yeah, we, we were having a, a sexual relationship," eh, until you know they found they the found the semen proof. on the dress. Ah, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. I just wasn't gonna say it, but yeah. I mean, th that's <laughs> it's it's the same thing in all of these cases. It's like John Locke. John Locke, who you were promoting for a long time mm -hmm. because he was giving a lot of hope to a lot of people. Uh, this is how I made all of this money. And it turned out that he was advocating it, that he didn't tell the whole story in the book. And that right. he was all paying of the he people was, yes, to buy to the leave books. Five and he star was, reviews. Yeah. And to buy the book. And yeah. And paying them more than the book was worth. So mm -hmm. that's how he did it. And it, that's why we will point out things. <sighs> 
there's we use the the whole sexual abuse thing or the whole um sexual problem because it's so prevalent and because everybody can can point out and say oh yeah i've heard about that there there are and this is coming from a um quote victim of abuse Mm -hmm. there are a lot of kids that nowadays see it as a tool to get what they want and there have been many cases one that i know of personally where it was used as a punishment for the parent because the parent didn't do something or did something that the kid didn't like so she said something happened that didn't and she she was eventually honest about it. Um, stuff like this happens and you can't get involved unless there's proof. At least this is this is what we believe. And right. we're not going to name and shame people. The, the other end, though, is like from Holly. Um, she had the, a person, a, a newspaper reporter or something. It was in the chat room that... that said your book was that said you were prolific but not yet good or something oh like yeah that. yeah he was yeah uh, for the which Washington is funny Post. because he obviously didn't understand the word of pro- prolific what it meant because <laughs> it was your first fucking point. book yeah <laughs> yes so and he didn't even read it right he we wouldn't necessarily name and shame him because this was a it's a long time ago mm-hmm. b he was just a douchebag yeah you know we're not out to destroy lives just because somebody was an asshole because again it's that virality it's that it's that thing of of people, you don't need to destroy somebody's life right and and people have a tendency if they smell blood in the water Mm-hmm. To want to pile on, to want to get They're involved, sharks. to want to, yes, and this is not a good quality because it destroys innocent lives. Yeah. Um, it it causes people to suicide. It causes them to to lose jobs. And if they are innocent, and you have had a part in that, then you you are guilty of something evil. Yeah. So, I, you know, my, my first rule, don't be evil. <laughs> That's a pretty good first yeah, basic humanity you know, humanity don't, be, rule. don't be evil. And yeah, so, We're not saying if you've shared viral videos, you're a bad person. Nothing like that. It's just maybe put a little bit more thought into the things that you're putting out into this world. Because if you are sharing negative viral videos, think about what you're spreading. One of the things that bothers me on Facebook a lot, and I will unfollow a bitch in a minute, in a, in a hot second, if somebody shares this, is animal abuse videos. I, I love to see the, the, the people who have rescued animals and see the before and afters, even, if it, even though they always make me cry because I hate seeing the befores. What I don't like is seeing the people who are spreading the videos of Animal, animal abuse, child abuse, um, without the conclusion, without any, okay, and this is how we made it better. All it is is this person should be punished. This person should go to jail. This person, you know, yeah, how horrible is this? You, if you're spreading stuff like that, you are spreading more anger and fear and hatred and. It's violence look, porn. It is. It's absolutely violence porn. And. There's a certain, I guess, adrenaline rush that we get from that anger. And we've talked about this before, is mm-hmm. that if you don't have something in your life that's positive, if you aren't creating, if you aren't focusing on a life purpose, then you're going to go to anger. Because anger gives you a feeling of purpose. It gives you a feeling of righteousness. It gives you a feeling of of. I'm better than this person. And look at how awful this person is. And sharing it makes me powerful or being anger makes me feel power or angry makes me feel powerful so there's a lot of that going on in the name and shame game that a lot of people play and I I can fully understand if you're sharing things for like there's a warrant out for this guy's arrest look at you know this is what he looks like let's spread this because a lot of those posts have led to arrest Mm -hmm. I think that's wonderful yeah but sharing a random video with no information on it whatsoever except for the video of a person shooting a dog or, you know, like beating the shit out of a kid. 
there's no reason for that. Right. There's no purpose for that. We already know that life has a very dark and seedy and awful side. Right. And that's part of that thing that mom is talking about is the blood in the water, the the shark side of our brains. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's falling for rage bait where somebody posts something that is unproven, but awful. A claim that is, is put out there along with maybe a snippet of a video or whatever, where this is what happened. And when other camera angles are brought in, it turns out they were lying their asses off. But in the meantime, the lying their asses off part doesn't get the kind of of promo that's like like 10 seconds at the end of a of, of a, a news show or whatever of yeah. oh well it turns out this wasn't true yeah but the rage and the damage to someone innocent has already been done absolutely they have done this with so many big name brands mm -hmm. out there that um stores chains that they that somebody just gets pissed off i guess because they you know didn't get a you know they had a quarter missing from their fucking venti latte or whatever the hell they bought or, or it didn't taste just right or it was overspiced or they were having a bad day and they made up some story about well this this particular business you know it refused to help veterans or this particular business um kicked a bunch of veterans out of and said no we won't serve you because you know you're american soldiers and it goes viral and I've seen this happen several times with several different companies. And the companies have to come out and say, this literally never happened. Right. But it's hard to disprove that. It's hard to prove that, well, this didn't happen because, you know. Yeah, so, it's so, hard to prove a negative. Yeah. You know, it's hard and, to prove the absence of a crime, even if there is an absence of a crime. Yeah. And people are just thoughtlessly sharing these things like, oh, mm -hmm. that's horrible. Oh, my God, I can't believe this happened. Sh click share. Right. And then now more people are seeing it. More people are sharing it. And it's the same the same mentality of of that that there's blood in the water. I'm a shark. I'm going to it. It's it's like you called it rage bait. And it's just shit that is, again, it's a way of controlling people. And we and that's why that's another reason why we don't play any name and shame game because we we aren't interested you have to focus on what you want to put out into the world right. and we're not talking about letting pe letting people get away with things obviously if you've seen something report it obviously if if you have been you know listening to a friend complain about something that happened to them in, in, insist that they report it right insist that they go to hr or talk to hr listen i think there might be a problem can we put up cameras don't name anything don't don't you know don't say you saw something you didn't right but instead of sharing this negative stuff find a way to flip it and find a way to try to help solve the problem right right and and focus focus on what good you can bring into the world and not what bad you can help spread the social media makes punishing the innocent an irrecoverable possibility in which people whose lives are ruined because of lies, those lives don't get unruined. Yeah, and if you have teenagers right now, I, I just, I, I can't warn you enough uh, against the stuff that I've seen on social media with teenagers. Just the, the popular girls have another way to, to destroy each other, to destroy other people, the, the, the people who are not popular do this i mean might have a huge facebook following and can destroy a snotty popular girl who just by spreading rumors on their facebook po following because they didn't like a popular girl i've seen this kind of stuff happen and like mom says it leads to suicide especially in teenagers because they're so young and they're so f they, they don't understand the scope of life and they don't understand their body's hormonal rage and their body's overreactions to things and ooh, at the same time I'm not nullifying what they're feeling what they're feeling is real so if you have teenagers now I just man I feel for you because I just I couldn't imagine having a teenager with social media and having to worry about cyberbullying. yeah 
Yeah. So that's why. Um, that's that's yeah. <laughs> why we don't name and shame. That's why yeah. we do not participate in rage bait. That's why we do not attack people. Um, that's why we um, focus on putting something positive out into the world. Yeah. And and make that our objective for every single episode we do. And, and yeah, we, I and do we'll, want to point out real quick too that we both have done things in our past that. Um, contradict this oh yeah um holly used to talk about politics on her blog i used to to shit on movies and actors on facebook and and my live journal and i used to um i've i've shared a couple of videos that or or memes that i thought you know like holy crap i can't believe that happened and then i looked into it further and i learned really really quickly um to look into shit before i share <laughs> Yeah, literally anything that I that I share that's like, oh, they're looking for this person. I will Google it first to make sure. Okay, well, that was eight years ago. She's been found, Mm -hmm. you know, something like that. Right. But and that's that's on the lesser scope. But we we have been there. We've done that. We've done stupid things. We're not fucking perfect. Right. But we have learned from our own lives and the wisdom of just growing older and the horror of seeing what social media can do that that we came to this point of the no name and shame yeah yeah and we have both been through some real shit too yeah which we have talked about in other episodes and which we will probably talk about again at some point um so the last thing there is you want to leave the field clear if there's a real thing for police to go in and find evidence, and if you're out there naming and shaming somebody, you are giving them an opportunity to destroy the evidence. Don't do that. See, and I was thinking the other thing. I was thinking, like, if you're constantly known for gossiping and sharing shit and just talking about rumors and, and stuff like that, if there's an actual problem, then you're the boy who cried wolf. Mm-hmm. Well, there's, because, a, yeah, there's that, too. Yeah, it's, it's like, oh, okay, well, this is just another attempt to stir up drama. Even on Facebook, even on anywhere else, I, I just people constantly posting negative bullshit drama, fam- like talking about personal stuff that should stay personal. If, if something actually happens, then it, people are just zoned out already. Right. They right. don't believe you. Let the real crimes be treated as real crimes, which means... You don't say anything until the authorities have gone in and found what they needed to do and have proven it. Yeah. And then you can say all the shit you want. Yeah. You know? <laughs> the hell with like, Harvey Weinstein. Yeah. And if, if you have seen something, then do your best to try to fix it. Do your best to try to be a part of the solution, not a part of the... You know, let's share. Let's this. share the witch hunt. Yeah. <laughs> I, I've seen a couple of people come out on social media and say, well, actually, that's not what happened. A lot of people think that that's that become things becoming viral is, is the best solution to get uh, or the best way to get a solution in their favor. But uh, people are still human. I think there's a lot of different ways to go about trying to solve a problem before it gets to that so right <laughs> but yeah okay. um is that that's the last question yeah right? that's the last question okay. and that's how i then, that's where we end that one so yeah and i think that's a, that's a perfect way to end this episode uh yeah that's i i think that that those are really really good questions that should were. help and if anybody you know if you have questions go into the forum that sort of thing that's really where we have the most interaction with our listeners. Of course, you can follow us on the social medias. That is at AIARWIP on Twitter, Alone with Invisible People on Instagram, Alone in a Room with Invisible People on Facebook, and you can find our website at alonewithinvisiblepeople.com. There are several ways to support us. Obviously, you can buy any of Holly's classes, any of Holly's fiction. You can also go to 
alonewithinvisiblepeople.com forward slash support us to find out all the different ways. But we do have a coffee account that's ko-fi.com forward slash alone. And there's also other options as well. You can follow affiliate links from the podcast, which is the best possible way because it supports both the podcast and Holly. <laughs> so uh, Holly had to leave early for this one. So I'm just going to say, you know, you remember what she says, you can do this, focus on your writing, focus on the positive, focus on what you want to bring to the world. And of course, we love you guys. And we are really looking forward to the next couple of weeks. We've got a fun episode coming up on Thanksgiving. We've got a bunch of interactive episodes. And we're going to have something for you guys for the new year that you're going to probably want to take part of. And uh, for, for some of the different episodes, we're going to be looking for some interaction with you folks. So get out your laptop, get out your pen and paper, and be ready for a little bit of fun. So we'll see you next week. <laughs>